So good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to Ortho TV, Ortho Nights. For further proceedings, I hand it over to our convener, Dr. Vikas Agarwal. Over to you, sir. Good evening, friends. It said that if you really want to learn a topic, you must attend a debate, and debate of two giants and in the two great uh, arthroscopists, uh, uh, Dr. Nilesh Kamath and Nagraj Chetty, and two uh, knights, Dr. Abhay Narvekar and Shirish Patak. So the topic today is dislocation, shoulder dislocation. The first episode of shoulder. Funny. Good evening, friends. It said that if you really want to learn a topic, it's best to uh, take part or uh, watch a debate. Now, debate today is how do you proceed if there is a shoulder dislocation in a young patient? Do we operate or do we conserve? For that, we have two uh, eminent arthroscopists, Dr. Abhay Narvekar and Dr. Shirish Patak. Uh, Dr. Abhay Narvekar would be talking on uh, will be talking on importance of surgery after the first shoulder dislocation. Well, Dr. Shirish Patak feels that there is no point in operating the first time. There are equally two equally eminent arthroscopists as panel members here, Dr. Nilesh Kamath and Dr. Nagra Chetty. I'll introduce all of them and then we will proceed with the debate. Dr. Abhay Narvekar is a consultant orthopedic surgeon and arthroscopic surgeon at Hinduja Hospital and Global Hospital. He has been practicing exclusive arthroscopic surgery for more than 30 years and has several publications in international and national journals. Dr. Shirish Patak is a shoulder surgeon and arthroscopist in Department of Shoulder and Sports Injury at Dinanath Hospital, uh, Pune. He is also a course director at Royal College of Surgeons, London, and has been faculty at several uh, sports medicine workshops. Dr. Nilesh Kamath is also a shoulder and arthroscopic surgeon at Pune, and uh, he is presently working as a consultant and unit chief at uh, Sancheti Jahangir and KM Hospital, Pune. Dr. Nagaraj Shetty is a consultant arthroscopy and knee and shoulder surgeon. Attached to Lilavati Hospital, Nanavati Hospital, Hinduja Healthcare Khar, and Municipal General Hospital, uh, uh, Bayasep Thakre, uh, uh, Hindu Rudai Samrat, Bayasep Thakre Municipal General Hospital. Over to you, Dr. Abhay Narvekar. Uh, should I scare my, share my screen? Hopefully... Yes, please. Okay. What is this? I did have not. I don't know why this is not showing scare screen. Can you? It will be just below our video. Yeah, I did that, but uh, open system preferences are saying. It's a MacBook, so you have to go through that. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. Are you allowing me to share? Keynote unknown, whiteboard unknown, iPad, iPad iPlay. No. I don't know. My screen is behind. 
Can you see the screen? No. No, we cannot. There's some problem here. Just share the desktop. And on the desktop, if you have your presentation. Share the desktop, can... but it is an explanation mark on the uh, desktop. Security and privacy to grant access. Open yeah, system. Open system preferences. Yeah, Zoom. open. Yeah, do that, sir. Okay. Okay, quit now. No. No. We can see. Later. Okay. I'll just check again. Now see. Okay. I think now I am okay. I think you open. No, I'm, I'm yes, okay. There's right. a problem with the system. Uh, okay. So I support uh, operative treatment for uh, first-time dislocators. And uh, I think we'll just go back. I would like to do this in certain stages. So if you go back to history, you'll find that it is probably one of the most fairly common uh, injuries of the shoulder known to the Egyptian murals in 3000 BC. Hippocrates, all of us know, has described it as traumatic. And as a matter of fact, he also described the voluntary besides the recurrent dislocation. Now let's go back to the general background. Generally, 2% of general population suffers from this. Most of them, 98% are anterior dislocation. So that's what we are discussing today. 90% of those occur in patients less than 30 years. So that's the other aspect that we are discussing today. We are probably closing down to this particular age group. Most of them are because of trauma. So we will exclude the other causes for dislocations. More common in males, more common in obviously sports and uh, other activities. Now, when we talk about anterior dislocation, what actually happens is that it is not an anterior, it's an antero inferior dislocation. So there is a damage to the antero inferior capsular ligamentous structures, but there is an associated injury to the posterior. Because the head moves in front, there is an associated injury to the posterior aspect of the head, and that is what we call as the hill sacs lesion. Now, the reason why this occurs is because the scapula is away from the thorax. It has a resting position, which is almost 5.4 degrees upward and a little internal rotation. So when the arm moves up, there is also an upward rotation of the scapula. So basically, the scapular orientation is also responsible for the anterior inferior dislocation rather than the anterior dislocation. Now, if you were to look at the biomechanics, and if you were to see that we as human beings are different from the lower animals. The reason primarily is because we are bipedal and our limbs are away from the actual skeleton. I think that is very important. And because our limbs are away from the actual skeleton and because we are able to raise our shoulder and not only raise, but circumduct our shoulder, we are, we are able to do most of the activities with our upper limbs. And this is possible because the scapula is away from the actual skeleton, from the thorax. And this is something like the crane that you see. And why I'm trying to tell you is that the scapula and the shoulder or the glenohumeral joint is not an isolated entity. So you have a base of the, of the uh, crane, which is basically of both lower limbs, your pelvis, you have the actual skeleton, you have the thoracic platform, and most importantly, you have the clavicle, which is suspended from the, the uh, uh, coraco, uh, uh, it is uh, suspended from the sternoclavicular joint. And to the boom, this is the boom of the crane, is attached the scapula by the coracoclavicular ligaments. Now, this scapula basically acts something like a pulley so that it will take forces from one side and transmit them to the glenohumeral region. So that is the function of the scapula. By saying all this, what I mean to say is that if the scapula is properly oriented, you would have a proper glenohumeral movement and vice versa. That if you do not have a properly oriented head on the scapula, you will have a lot to play throughout this particular system, which we call as the kinetic chain. So we have described the glenohumeral joint, something like a ball on a tee when you are playing golf, so it is sort of balanced in that fashion. And in order to keep that in place, we have seen that you require a balanced forces of the axiosscapular muscles, as well as the scapulohumeral muscles. These scapulohumeral muscles are not individual. They are all interlinked, whether it's the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the subscapularis, and the infraspinatus, they all are interlinked. 
and the ball is suspended on the glenoid something like something like this dolphin and if you have one particular situation where there is a loss of concavity of this particular glenoid you can see that the ball is going to shift on one side if the ball shifts on one side the entire entire kinetic chain is going to be affected because now the muscles which are basically trying to balance these forces are also mm -hmm. going to be affected so in short what i'm trying to tell you is that when we talk about dislocation and recurrent dislocation it is not the only thing that could happen to your shoulder but all myriad things would happen to the shoulder if you do not basically take this and treat it adequately importantly the shoulder is one joint where we need to repair everything unlike the knee where many of the things are reconstructed but shoulder is one joint where most of the things need to be repaired and when you talk about repair that repair has to be precise now if you look at the most important structure which is going to prevent this the antero inferior labrum it is thick it is rounded it is convex it has a bumper more importantly it is integrated now these are anatomical facts which occur because of the biomechanics and this is integrated to the articular cartilage and it is this that increases the depth of the glenoid by almost 50% so this is actually along with the inferior glenohumeral ligament it takes up all the compressive forces that are coming through the glenohumeral joint unlike that the superior labrum is relatively lax so we know that this superior labrum is not contributing much it has the biceps which is attached to it and it takes all the tensile forces so once the inferior labrum it it tears it tends to move medially on the glenoid now when it tends to move medially on the glenoid you have what we call as the anterior labral periosteal sleeve lesions now these anterior labral periosteal sleeve lesions are extremely common in the younger age group because of the pathomechanics that i have been describing so if you look at the shoulder stability the shoulder stability is provided by what one is the concavity compression also called concentric compression the concavity compression provided by the concavity of the glenoid the compression that is provided by a balanced forces of the uh, cuff muscles the rotator cuff as well as the axioscapular musculature we also is important is the scapular orientation that if you have an abnormality anteriorly as i said the scapular orientation will be affected because of this connection and you get what is known as an associated scapular dyskinesia and obviously the basic stability of the shoulder would depend upon the inherent genetic glenoid and humeral architectural versions something that we cannot control so these four or five things actually contribute with the king man being the capsule ligamentous antero inferior complex so when we are treating a person who has a dislocation of the shoulder what do we want to do is not only manage that episode of dislocation but we want to manage it in such a fashion that there is no threat of recurrence number 2 that he has such functional recovery that he is able to do all his day to day activities one of the most being as a human being raising your shoulder up circumducting your shoulder having no apprehension in doing that no pain in doing that and also an ability to get back to the same level of activities which are overhead most of them being young would obviously have sporting activities and the most important thing is you do not want future glenohumeral arthritis whenever you have this type of a dislocation so if you look at the pathophysiology actually what happens is that once you have damaged this soft tissue which is the antero inferior tissue that tends to have there tends to be a micro instability this repetitive micro trauma because every time the person is going to raise his shoulder he is going to basically cause the ball to move anteriorly because there is no restraint so this would bring about micro trauma which increases the laxity of the structures in front so there is a capsular elongation along with this as the head moves forward there would be anterior glenoid bone defects and because of these bone defects you would have a recurrence where this particular bone defect would also we really have to be addressed if you were not to address it right at the outset and then at that point of time you would be doing salvage procedures rather than a simple primary repair of the structure which was torn and it has been shown 25 years later that those people who have 
a recurrent dislocation would have probably 40% chance of arthritis as compared to those who do not have recurrent dislocation. So the primary aim is also to see that you do not have instability and recurrent dislocation. Now, when we talk about recurrent dislocation, you have to understand what is instability because very often instability laxities are used very uh, confusingly you know, with each other. Laxity with symptoms in short is instability. So when a person who is lax, like for instance, this girl is lax, but she is not symptomatic. So looseness, discomfort, slipping, shoulder going out, such symptoms when a loose person has, we call that as an instability. So it could be in one direction, it could be in various directions. Now let us look at the instability spectrum because when I want to treat these patients, I want to know what is the incidence and what is the historic, historical recurrence of that particular disorder. Now, if the person is less than 10 years, the incidence, thank God, is less than 2%. And the recurrence rate, however, in these young children is 100%. If you look at the age group of 10 to 20, the incidence now has gone up. It is almost 20%. And the recurrence rate is 70 to 94%. Now, of those 10 to 20 years patients, those who have a closed epiphysis would have a 14 times more instability if you do not treat their first dislocation than those who have open epiphysis, especially in the age group of 10 to 13 years. Now, if the person is less than 30, then the incidence has gone down. It has come to almost 50 from, uh, has gone up, sorry, to almost 50%. The recurrence rate is 72%. If you go between 30 to 40, the incidence has gone down to 30, but the recurrence rate also goes down. So as the age is going up, the recurrence rates are going down, probably because the level of activity is going down. And the second reason is probably because the collagen tissue, as you mature, starts becoming more and more stiff. And as you grow older, therefore, in that age group, between probably 30 and 50, you would have more fractures around the humerus and the scapula rather than dislocations. And those patients who are more than 60, the incidence is almost 12 to 20%. They have a dislocation primarily because of a cuff lesion. So they have nothing to hold the, hold the head behind. And that is why cuff lesions are very common with older patients who are more than 60 years old. So what happens if you were to give conservative treatment to patients who have undergone a dislocation? Basically, it causes a repetitive sub failure. You may not have an actual dislocation, but there would be repetitive sub failures because the head tends to move anteriorly. There is a repetitive, after this repetitive loading, there is this accumulation of microtrauma. And eventually this microtrauma will give rise to a capsular elongation. And this will then give rise to recurrent dislocations. Because of this anterior translation, there will be progressive bone defects and increased risk of arthrosis. So if you look at this particular uh, you know, video of a dislocation, but this has not been first time dislocated, but the number of dislocations have been less than five, you'd see that the tissue, that is the labrum and the inferior glenoid humeral ligament is fairly robust. Taking stitches becomes very easy. Getting anatomy back is fairly predictable. Compare this with this situation where there is a recurrent dislocation. Look at the amount of debris that you find inside the joint. The size of his hill sacs lesion has gone up significantly. The head is riding anteriorly. There is no anterior tissue in the form of because this is a very common situation where I said it causes a ellipsa lesion. So the entire tissue has gone on the medial aspect of the glenoid. So you have to raise this tissue up. The quality of the tissue has gone down. You eventually not only have to repair that, but you also have to do something posteriorly, what we call as a remplissage, where we attach the posterior capsule and infraspinate tendon into the head in order to pull the head behind. So you are doing relatively higher type of surgeries with lesser chances of success. So if you don't, you don't mind conserving something as long as you do not have a price to pay for it. I wouldn't mind being conserved if I don't have to pay anything for it. But even if you have two dislocations, we know that the, there is something to pay for it. There are more chances of ellipsal lesions. There are more capsular injuries. There is more cartilage damage. 
the hill sac starts becoming bigger there is an increased glenoid bone loss and from then eventually getting operated for a simple repair i need to get some sort of a salvage procedure and i know that i am exposing now this person to a higher rate of degenerative glenohumeral arthritis then what is the advantage of surgery obviously you minimize the recurrence you improve the quality of life but look at this particular video look at the tissue the tissue is red the tissue is just waiting to be repaired back it is robust and you know for sure that this tissue is a very healthy tissue which on repair is going to give back the anatomy a good paper by arsior and teller this is a very old paper has shown that in 24 years i mean patients who are less than 24 years they have more of bankart's lesions and hill sac lesions but there is never a gross capsular damage and moreover these people also have a fairly low incidence of bone loss so that means all this bone loss basically occurs much later with repetitive dislocations or anterior translations or micro instabilities but not every patient would require surgery you have to look whether the person has got epilepsy a, a multi directional laxity or instability which is multi directional he has medical comorbidities who is not likely to follow a post op program and definitely voluntary dislocated so these are not the guys that you are going to basically do a repair on so risk factors we've seen and the risk factors for recurrence even after the first we know is young age glenoid bone loss hill sac lesion ligamentous laxities multi directional etc so now let's look at whatever what i have said whether there is any literature backing and the literature backing i will go in stages so there is this paper which tells you in 2019 that the quality of the labrum also decides whether your success is going to be there post operatively after you repair and more the number of pre operative dislocations the chances of failure following a repair are also higher so you are exposing yourself as a surgeon to a greater chance of failure another editorial commentary by none other but stephen bukar says that off track hill sac lesions are extremely common in adolescents so adolescent people uh, children who have dislocations have very high hill sac lesions which tend tend to be off track that means they tend to engage and therefore he has made a very strong case for an arthroscopic bank card repairs for these adolescents first time anterior dislocators let's go whether it is a subluxation or dislocation actually the pathology does not matter so instability due to both of them will give rise to similar results will give rise to similar pathologies i will take you now to this wonderful paper which was published not only in jbgs but also in the journal of arthroscopy way back in 1989 and this was by again robert arsero and james wheeler and this they did a study on the uh, military cadets and what did they find that they took up uh the uh, military cadets with dislocation of their shoulders and they found 14 months follow up that 92% of those who were conserved these are all first time dislocators 92% of those who were conserved had instability at 14 months whereas 78% of those who were operated were successful now the important thing is that imagine in 1989 when arthroscopy and this is done an arthroscopic repair what we are talking about is an arthroscopic repair 14 months later now we know that 14 i mean in 1989 arthroscopy of the shoulder was in its infancy and the way the tissue was repaired was by what we call as staple capsulography that means understanding of the basic anatomy was also not there that you got to really have that labrum right on top of the glenoid yet those who were operated did well so obviously there was probably a thing thinking that maybe because the surgery probably acts as maybe a placebo and therefore there was this another paper which was done and they have found that you know what they did was they divided these patients into three groups those in whom they were conserved first time dislocators those in whom they were operated and a bankart's repair was done and another group where only a lavage was done and what was the result at one year yes the lavage patients okay there was a 13% failure as against conserved which was again the failure rate was very high 43% but at 4 years the lavage patients the failure rate was 55% so lavage definitely was not 
basically did not act as a placebo, you need to repair this tissue back to where they belong. I think that is very important. There's another paper where they took 25 patients, one in whom they were dislocated the first time dislocators were operated, and other group of 25 patients who were operated after recurrent dislocation. So one, you have a group with single dislocation, another group with multiple dislocations. And what did they find? Basically, those people who were operated for the first time, they had no recurrence at 12 months to four years post-op. Only one person, one person, that is 4% only, had a little instability and therefore was classified as unsatisfied. As against those in whom surgery was done following recurrent dislocations, 8% was the uh, uh, failure rate. That means there was a recurrence of dislocation in 8% of those 25 patients and 10% had basically unsatisfactory results. And what was the reason? What did they find? Those in whom a recurrent dislocation was there, the basic tissue healing environment itself was not very good. The poor healing environment would then contribute towards this. Now, from short follow-ups, if you look at longer follow-ups, this was a paper from Denmark in which 10 years following uh, patients, they did a bank parts repair and the same uh, patients where they were conserved. 72% of primary bank parts repair had excellent results. 75% of conserved had unsatisfactory results because of pain, instability, and stiffness. And now, finally, let me now come to the last particular exhibit. And this is a paper which has been published on May 2020 in the Journal of Arthroscopy, in which they have done a wonderful study of uh, a meta-analysis of current evidence in the literature of comparing arthroscopic bank arts repair versus conservative management for the first time anterior shoulder dislocator. So this is a meta-analysis. And let me just show you in this particular thing what was studied. They say that those who, on whom arthroscopic repair was done, those patients who had a recurrence, there were 10 studies in this in which the patients had recurrence. That means in this study, there are 299 patients who had recurrence. Those on whom a arthroscopic repair was done, the recurrence rate was only 9.7%. Whereas 270 patients on whom conservative treatment was given, the recurrence rate was 67.4. So where is 9.7, where is 67.4? Stability studies were also done. So they assessed the stability studies. There were six studies which, in which had, they had basically done the stability of the glenohumeral joint. There were 185 patients in all these six studies. 5.9% basically had unstable following arthroscopic repair. 46.7% had uh, uh, instability after conservative. And 92.8% went back to sports once they were operated. 80% went back to sports when they were conserved. And there was a wonderful editorial commentary that followed this in which Matthew Provencher had said that patients who are less than 25 years, who are males, sports participants, they should be surgically stabilized at their first episode because a recurrence rate of 9.7% uh, of repair against 67.4% conserved is just not acceptable. And these are all level one, level two studies where meta-analysis has been done, where apples have been compared to apples. I think there is no need to say anything more. The management is obvious. So if I were to summarize, there is an irrefutable evidence because of systematic review, RCTs, uh, level one, two studies, et cetera, that there is an unacceptable high incidence of recurrent instability in conserved patients. There is a progression of arthritis, which is directly related to instability. Arthroscopic bank card repair has to be offered, therefore, as a routine in young first-time dislocators. And with my own anecdotal experience, I completely support this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Narvekar, for an excellent uh, analysis of the problem and uh, supporting your view that first-time dislocations need to be operated. Friends, there is always another side of the coin. And Dr. Shirish Patak is going to explain to us the other side of the coin. The first time dislocations need not undergo surgery. So may I request Dr. Shirish Patak to explain why he supports that view that first time dislocations need not be operated. Over to Dr. Shirish Patak. 
good evening everyone i hope you can hear me and you can see my screen as well can you see that yes, yes. we can yeah okay so first of all before i start my talk i would like to thank ortho tv team neeraj ashok uh, for setting up this uh, fantastic debate i also thank panelist and moderator dr agash dr nilesh dr nagraj and last but not the least dr narvekar for putting up his side so strongly so i am here to defend that conservative treatment is better for young first time shoulder dislocator this is my disclaimer so no personal attacks no personal comments if at all sir feels that way please forgive me for that that was an impressive lecture from a stalwart but loud is not always true 10 years back when i was naive i listened to a similar talk by a senior and successful shoulder surgeon and i was sold to the idea of fixing all young first time shoulder dislocators my workload increased significantly patients were happy i was happy implant industry was happy and i was thinking why were we even debating i think we should fix them all there is no no need to conserve first time dislocator but unfortunately same happy patient with a juicy repairable labrum where i did a perfect job came back with a recurrence after one year while he was playing he was back to his pre injury level then i was shocked surprised what went wrong was it a wrong decision making so i did some introspection and thought whether my decision making was eminence based that i am i am idolizing someone and he told me to fix all first time shoulder dislocation so i started doing it is it right was it evidence based or all implant companies want me to hammer anchors in each and every shoulder just because there is radiological evidence of shoulder dislocation so then i decided let us get back to the basics what is best surgery or treatment for any pathology so it has to be a procedure which has got low failure rates high success rate low complication rates and it should be able to give similar result in average hands it should not require you know some extra skill which cannot be done by an average arthroscopist so what is best for young and first time shoulder dislocator yes i am going to stick to the same high risk group what dr narvekar commented upon so let us go step by step so it is not very clear to me what is young is it 20 25 30 because when we refer to literature every study has got their reference their definition of young but i am happy whatever i learned from uh, dr narvikar's lecture he took it as a 30 so assume that whatever is less than 30 is young and more than 30 is not young so i presume that my opponent agrees that one can offer conservative treatment for a first time dislocator who is not young by definition okay so at least the problem who is 30 plus and first time dislocator at least they are saved nobody wants to operate i presume in my practice i offer surgery only after two or more traumatic dislocations irrespective of age see i i saw a lot of slides mentioning you know high rates of failure of conservative treatment we knew about it but let me tell you they are not so high in the literature i will prove it to you refer to level level 1 and level 2 studies and you can go through few pickups i have done less than 25 years of age robinson hovelius lawton they were all level 1 level 1 level 4 and if you see the recurrence rate is 56 52 40 
yes now roe has mentioned 80 but imagine it was mentioned in 1956 that is 60 years i was not even born at that time so i will rely on data which is recent maybe last 2 3 4 decades but still i respect that figure because sometimes in few series it is definitely shown to be high but not so high definitely and we understand the high recurrence rate that's why we offer surgery for recurrent shoulder dislocation and recurrent means who comes or who has two or more dislocations nobody can ignore this landmark paper by hovelius which started in 1978 it was a prospective study they followed up almost 250 patients over 25 years in different age groups and you can see what they have mentioned less than 22 so called high risk group only 55% patient had recurrence i would believe in this paper more than any other so 50% of patients never dislocated this is another paper and a systematic review and meta analysis published recently 2015 in bmj by olds from new zealand again see now if you stick to the high risk group 15 to 20 or maybe 30 there are only six studies two studies 15 to 20 and six studies 15 to 30 and look at the percentage of recurrence i disagree with dr narvikar sir they mention 51 49 36 they are not in range of 80 90 there are few reports which have been published long 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 time back which i tend to ignore them now in present era in 2020 with due respect so now i think what has happened you know the title of the debate is whether one should operate or conserve so i think no my opponent has completely mistaken it we are not comparing results of operative versus non operative for first time dislocator actually the real debate is whether the post op recurrence rates for first time dislocator are more than recurrent dislocator so am i offering something extra better result if i operate them just after first dislocation i am saying don't operate after first dislocation if he gets a second one you have full right to operate with same data whatever he has shown i would also back my decision of surgery after second or more dislocations and of course if you see there are a lot of studies which claim 2% 4% results recurrence rate but they are all short term we have to look at the long term so i'm going to go take you through literature review believe me this was done with a very balanced and neutral mind not just to pick up few literature support which will su support and defend my side so this is a 10 year follow up a french shoulder surgeon group where they did arthroscopic bank cart repair within one month of injury 21 patient it's a small group but followed up for almost 10 years and 35% of these patients had recurrent dislocation or subluxation and mind well in spite of surgery 15% of these patient they develop osteoarthritis so osteoarthritis development is not purely based on conservative treatment it is the natural history of any dislocator at times there could be iatrogenic damage which can lead and cause more damage and arthritis than conservative treatment and they compared their studies results with non operative and operative and here i can see see if i want to do some procedure i think success rate or recurrence rate should be less than 5 if not 10% but see arsario robinson kirkley all have more than 14 to 35% of recurrence and look at the recurrence rate after conservative so now recurrence rate after surgery are slowly inching towards the recurrence rate of 
non operative treatment this is another systematic review this is a very important systematic review they included 15 studies five studies were based only on first time shoulder dislocator and 10 were on recurrent shoulder dislocation 10 were level 1 five were level 2 and these are some certain tables and you can just glance through the recurrence rate for first time their average is 15% and in recurrent again they 4 24 10 15 23 11 6 so the conclusion is there were no significant differences in the recurrence rate or complication among young active patient who had undergone arthroscopic repair irrespective whether they were undergone surgery after first or multiple dislocation another paper 100 patient a long term follow up in this particular group from germany they have even divided the patient population into different groups and see the recurrence rate of age group less than 20 years it is almost 40% i don't think it is acceptable if you are doing a primary repair and 4 out of 10 patients are getting recurrence and 50% of them are getting recurrence within one year i think that is unacceptable only risk factor they found was five dislocation not even two so the results recurrence was worse in a smaller age group otherwise overall recurrence was 22% so one in five that is unacceptable and only 40% of patient could return to pre injury sports see when we convince a patient that he needs to undergo surgery after first dislocation we have to assure him that he should be able to return to sports and i won't go into the detail of so much literature on return to sport but hardly 50% of patient have made it to their pre injury levels after surgery so in short the younger age and sports activity and level of activity it carries similar degree of recurrence risk not only for non operative but if you are operating such patient even the recurrence rate is going to be very very high as compared to older population these are worthy comments from matson a bankart repair for a first time dislocator must be considered as a prophylactic procedure this is an important quote from robinson his study to prevent one patient from sustaining further dislocation 4.7 patient would need to be treated now if you go through the literature cochrane database there is limited evidence available to prove that surgery for high risk group is very useful and the caveat against the study shown by sir you see these are all military recruits and provencher and his group has done lot of studies on this military rec recruits their their demands of the shoulder are not comparable to common person or even athlete and when you look at athlete it is not that same rule is going to apply for all athletes a cyclist a basketball player a volleyball player a football player you know so each game is different so you can't apply same logic to every athlete this is another landmark meta analysis 12 studies they have done results and failure and revision rates for arthroscopic repair after first dislocation and they again compared to conservative treatment this is the mistake It is bound to be low but they could not prove that it was better when they did after first dislocation as compared to recurrent dislocations so again it boils down to is it really necessary to do surgery after first dislocation why so much hurry especially in a young athlete 2008 sacks the recommendation is choice of early surgery based on presumption of future dislocation happiness and disability cannot be justified and one aspect we are completely missing out 
when we are talking about the success rate we are just talking about the chances of redislocation or resubluxation but what about the complications i know they are less as compared to open procedure but see nerve injury infection suture anchor problem depending on the level of uh, surgeon skills chondrolysis stiffness oa these are all complication of arthroscopic labral repair and if you uh, go through pubmed you will find n number of article mentioning oa stiffness ranging from 7 to 40% after surgery so please do not overlook complication they become part of your results so dear friends wisdom is not in it it is acquired you learn you acquire knowledge your experience your own and others which we call evidence your own failures you see others failing and that whole experience makes you wiser so today now if you ask me will you fix a young first time shoulder dislocator i would say this is inadequate information i would like to know age sex of the patient whether it is traumatic whether what type of sport does he play is it contact non contact whether he is in season off season what is mindset of patient is he willing for surgery are his parents willing for surgery and last but not the least in my practice affordability is also very important aspect of course there are certain situations where i would recommend that we must fix them so bony bank cards so you should have a very high level of suspicion when you deal young first time shoulder dislocator if you find that you can easily redislocate them under ga do true ap x ray do x ray do ct scan mri don't miss it because this is the chance the best chance to fix them and give fantastic result a persistent dislocation or it's a displaced tuberosity after reduction you should fix them so my approach would be thorough clinical and radiological assessment discussion with athlete parent and coaches discuss the options considerations of surgery and return to play without surgery also and then let them take the decision so in short the consensus for treatment of first time dislocator is still lacking now the next comment which i am going to make is completely out of reach of this debate but french shoulder surgeon group is advocating primary lethargy surgery because they feel the results of bankard repair are unacceptable so we need to retrospect introspect so there is definitely scope for research we need more randomized trial with longer duration so to conclude first line of treatment for first time shoulder dislocator is conservative but at the same time don't deny the right of surgery to very high risk young athlete involved in contact and over sport, overhead sports after due counseling thank you thank you very much uh, dr patel for thank putting you, your view quite strongly and uh, I, I think it is time that we take opinion of the panelists first, and then we go ahead with uh, take some questions. Uh, Dr. Nilesh Kamath, can you unmute yourself? Both both the panelists may I request Dr. Nagraj Shetty also to unmute yourself. And uh, Dr. Nilesh Kamath, first, if you can tell us what is your opinion? What is your opinion? Does a first time young first time dislocator deserve surgery immediately, or as Dr. Patak said? he would wait for one more dislocation right so i think there is no no one one sentence answer for for this question and like what dr narvekar sir and uh, shirish has shown i personally believe literature can be tweaked on either side you can tweak it for tweak it against what is more important is we are discussing about young and what we need to understand is the activity demands if there is a high risk patient and if you are able to identify this high risk patient then definitely i would go in for for surgery but at the same time if this is a patient who is probably not going to do the so called weekend warrior might just play occasional sports over the weekend and do a sedentary job otherwise i don't think i would be inclined to offer him surgery at the first dislocation itself so that's what that would be my brief approach to it but there's lot of it much more beyond what we have spoken 
and we still don't have a consensus on this there's absolutely no denial to it and that's why the take home from this debate has to be very important we can't just say yes for everyone or can't just say no for everyone identification of high risk group is what is most important for me yes dr nagraj what is your opinion thank you dr nagesh thank you sir. i think uh, i echo with uh, most of the points which uh, nilesh mentioned i think i echo some of the points with dr narvikar sir mentioned and echo some of the points with dr shirish mentioned now we need to understand that instability is a very very broad spectrum which doesn't doesn't just involve a particular subset of patients uh, it also depends upon what sort of a practice pattern you have now for example if i have a practice pattern treating collision athletes a young kabaddi player who comes to me in the age group of 25 or less than 25 with a first time dislocation is totally different than a person like all nilesh mentioned a weekend warrior so it depends on what practice pattern you have it also depends on what stage of the disease pathology the patient comes to you so if there is a first time dislocator who comes to me at 3 months post dislocation he has gone through his conservative treatment when i examine him he doesn't have any apprehension whatsoever so i'm sure that particular patient even dr narvikar sir will probably not operate so the unfortunate reality is that we do not have a treatment algorithm today for recurrent dislocators we still have an algorithm in terms of bone loss in terms of ligament laxity in terms of the hill sacks index the on track on track off track lesion but for the first time dislocator as of today we don't have a treatment algorithm we need to go by our practice patterns the stage of presentation the age of the patient activity demand uh, associated factors presence of uh, bony lesions amount of displacement so there are various uh, parameters which we need to analyze before we fix up surgery for a first time dislocator thank you very much uh, i think uh, dr narvekar would you like to add to whatever you have discussed earlier uh the thing is that you know we as surgeons just think of only one item and that is recurrence we are not looking at instability symptoms because many of our patients what they do is they accept after their dislocation a certain degree of disability and they live within that disability what i have been trying to do is trying to make you understand that because there is a problem at one end it is going to cause multiple problems through the entire chain and that is something that all of us because most of the papers they look at recurrence some papers look at instability but what you have to look at is all these factors and therefore there is as a matter of fact internationally there is a model that is being created it is known as a decision analysis model now in this decision analysis model all that we have said has been put inside now this is a computerized model and this is what we need and this is a model that is going to be available both to the patient as to as well as the surgeon so what you have to do is you have to put in your age your sex what is your level of activity today what is the etc uh, etc et so it gives you what things you have to put in and what you get out is what are the chances of recurrent dislocation what are the chances of uh, uh you know instability what are the chances of degenerative arthritis depending upon all the inputs that you have put in getting all these studies together into a computerized model and this is known as a decision analysis model and this is the only way out for a situation such as this because otherwise you will go on debating and like what nile says if i want to tomorrow if you ask me to talk about conservative probably i would pro say it as emphatically as i said the first time dislocator so that is the problem with medicine and what naga said is absolutely true it depends upon the type of practice that you have and secondly the belief that you have and the capability that you have in your own surgical skills and what happens is you can it happens with every every uh, uh, surgery and every surgeon that as you go on top of your learning curve you will find that your indications become much uh, much easier and therefore those whom you would have probably conserved at the beginning of your curve at the top of your curve once you have crossed it you would probably start operating on them so there are myriad myriad things that come you know in this picture giving one particular reason or one particular aspect becomes difficult but still if the person is uh, a first time dislocated two things i would like to see is what is going to be his level of activity in future i would like to see what side of his shoulder is affected what uh, you know is expected of him and what has happened during the dislocation that is very important if that person at the first dislocation is uh, you know is extremely apprehensive has got stiffness at that time is psychologically very affected by that first dislocation 
okay i know that this particular person is bound to have recurrence etc he is the type of person that i would probably operate so these are other things that you are going to contribute besides the fact that he has a dislocation thank you very much so uh, a lot of discussion with patients is maybe his parents and uh, his his attitude will play a major role uh, dr patak you are uh, would you like to say a few words now after the panelists on and dr narvekar has uh, discussed this again yeah so uh, i agree with the panelists that see what has happened is uh, our indian culture is completely different you know it is not about shoulder any person who visits your clinic first wants to ask you whether can he avoid the surgery but see i am seeing now this we are changing 10 years back when we had uh, one australian surgeon coming to india for uh, doing a live surgery he told us that uh, he does seven to eight surgeries every day i said how come so many shoulder patient come to you he said in australia the acceptance or tolerance limit of pain shoulder pain is very low the moment they have some sort of pain they want to come and get it fixed so that was not the case 10 years back but now we have seen the difference you know now patient come to you they have a minor supraspinatus tear and you don't want to do surgery but he says if you have a solution for it please fix it i can't go with this sort of pain so I, this sort of trend is coming even in young shoulder dislocators so that's what i said uh, you have to have a very good dialogue with the patient at the same time we have to understand only bankard repair is not the pathology there is multifactorial you have to tell patient even if it, this is the best treatment in the best hand still it may have about 10% of recurrence rate he should not come and blame you that you told surgery after first dislocation we did it we spent so much money and now again he has a dislocation so one in 10 patient is is going to come back so if you have done a proper counseling then i think there should not be any problem so you are on mute yes nilesh please yeah so can i ask both the speakers that when it comes to a young uh, primary dislocator and let's say when i'm saying young less than 20 years and as a take home would you would it be safe to say that yes you would image all of them beyond a plain x ray or uh, let's say a grashi view and a lateral view and a striker notch view would you get an mri for all of them so that would probably be a good take home message for the viewers or would you just be happy to get just x rays rehabilitate them or at three weeks clinically assess them and then take a call on mri both narvikar sir uh, shirish and uh, nagraj your views i think i always get an mri done for all these young person Okay. i tend to operate on these much more than what uh, probably uh, you know i conserve them as i said that i know that when i operate on this my success rate is going to be very high and i'm going to be okay. very confident in telling that patient because the quality of tissue everything is going to be good we don't just look at the dislocation you look at the instability look at the micro instability that is going to happen look at the extent of the tear that is going to progress and i know that my success rate at that point is going to be and today the morbidity of that surgery is not that high if you were to tell me that look you would have to open this patient the morbidity of getting his range back is a, is a big problem obviously you're going to conserve because probably your conservative results would be as good but the moment as i said very earlier that as your thing goes over the uh, learning curve etc and you have better tools today to operate i think with this young guy there is no reason why you should deny him and i i can tell you also that the moment this younger generation is different from the older generation the younger generation the moment they find that they have a problem this is what you have seen also in the acls that the moment they have a tear they want it to be repaired like what shirish said just now that if you have a small supraspinatus tear they want they want it to be repaired whereas you and i are going to tell him no don't get repaired so i think it is very important for you to first decide and i think the post op is very important it is not just the surgeon that post op regime and the way these people have to be handled before you send them back is extremely important something that somehow there has been to my mind the failure rate being high is not because of the surgery but it is because of the post op regime that is not being followed the way it should be followed and half of this is because there is no communication between you and the physio right so i was going to get an mri for sure shirish how about you yeah i think it is wiser yeah. to get so mri you will get an mri and agraj 
I think uh, uh, just can I can I take a minute to answer that question? Yeah, please. I think it would depend upon couple of uh, factors in history. Now, if I have a patient who had a significantly high velocity injury, he had a fall from a bike or it was a contact collision kind of a sport where he dislocated his shoulder. He remained dislocated. He was he required a forceful kind of a reduction. He uh, was done. Now this is a high index of suspicion patient. Immediate MRI for sure. Vis-a-vis -vis a patient who had a simple kind of a subluxation event or immediately reduced the shoulder back, I would rather reserve the MRI at about four weeks, five weeks, wherein I know there is a there is a bank cut lesion, but at MRI at five weeks or so will tell me whether it is actually healed or no, which will help me in counselling that particular patient. So again, MRI would depend on various factors. This is one of the factors I would think about. Okay, uh, so I'll just add here: uh, five weeks will never show healing on the MRI. Yeah, it will not. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is the problem. You will yeah. see the same lesion what you saw on day one as you would see at at five and six weeks. Agreed. Sir. So, in addition to the clinical examination findings of yes. you know no yes. apprehension, it would it would add yes. some value. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, so speaking for myself, I would probably in the young high risk uh, post traumatic uh, patients, of course, I'll get an MR. Not for any other reason, because many times, as what Sir described in biomechanics, they don't have an isolated bank cut, and the tear extends proximally into the biceps. And if that's what's happening, then it's a no brainer that patient gets a surgery straight away. So probably it's safe for us to tell all the viewers also that a primary high risk patient, that means a young primary post traumatic dislocator, don't just stop at plain X rays. Please go ahead and get an MRI done. At least to document what is the kind of injury that what is looking at. Then probably whether to operate or not operate, you can discuss with the relatives and the patient himself, and then you can come to a consensus. But at least one take home is something which is important to be driven home here. Can I can I yeah. come in, uh, sir, with one one yeah. more uh, point? I think uh, uh, both sir and uh, Shirish have covered literature extremely well. Probably one article which probably needs to be mentioned is by Peter Habermeyer. Where they have talked about the stages of the tissue quality and what really happens to the tissue as the dislo number of uh, dislocations increase. So the concept of plastic deformation. We are only talking about the anatomical structure. We are forgetting the concept of plastic deformation. So it's not necessary that the patient has a formal dislocation event per se. Even mild subluxation keeps contributing to the plastic deformation, which is actually stage two. And we know that when we operate on a patient, probably even after the second dislocation. he might have had micro instability episodes contributing to plastic deformation so when we are doing the arthroscopy all the panelists would agree we are not as confident about this entity being healed as well as it would be in a primary situation so let's not forget that uh, uh, the tissue quality undergoes changes as the disease uh, duration increases that yeah, i think now that, i think that's that's very important because this is where the cultural differences in the indian population comes into picture that if we even guide them that don't get operated at a index dislocation and come back immediately after the second dislocation unfortunately as shirish said that denial is there that they don't want to come in and then they'll probably come in after say six or five or four dislocations by then the tissue quality is going to further be of the alza is going to be there right from the initial stages but it's going to inspection if patients understand this at the outset they don't neglect even if you observe like the fact that it's not a normal shoulder at this point of time and this may require intervention later thank you now my my question to uh, dr shirish is uh, how do you conserve good old days we used to give them a shoulder immobilizer for 3 weeks do you still follow that practice or there is something different number 2 is is there a difference as far as physiotherapy is concerned when you conserve or when you operate and that is for everyone uh, thirdly the range of movement that you achieve is different in conserved cases or in operated cases and lastly are there any special precautions in each group yeah so th that is really a very good question so i think uh, now it has in the literature it has been proven there is no uh, role of uh, immobilization of shoulder as such for a long time like 4 weeks 6 weeks so what i normally do for all my patient is after reduction 
uh, I take check X-rays to AP axillary. Everything is well in place. Then I put them in sling, and maybe a week or ten days till there is pain, swelling, and inflammation. And the moment they are pain free, I ask them to discard the sling and start doing gentle range of movement, avoiding abduction, external rotation, overhead activities. And I continue it for four weeks in the same way. After four weeks, the protocol is same. as i follow for post operative uh, bank card repair so they start with range of movement isometric exercises then theraband exercises but no forceful external rotation and stretching in early uh, uh, rehab period up to 3 months and i think more or less the protocol is same in respect of age group but i'll be little more protective for their return to sports uh, in younger population any difference protocol any of you follow or it is the same ten days of sling and then start mobilizing any different protocol you follow when you conserve i, I, I think conserve them i keep them in a sling for a little longer time okay. i want that entire uh, soft tissue trauma to actually uh, get uh, this thing and uh, in that time i allow the uh, physio to do a little bit of isometric scapular exercises so they do a little bit of what we call as low row exercises so that the scapular muscles and the scapular stabilizers they do not go into a type of protrude you know they tend to protract the scapula tends to protract when you do that so that protraction is something that you want to avoid in them at the same time you do not want them to go into external rotation and abduction so some uh, sort of uh, statics are given at that point of time and then like what he said progressively we start doing scapular humeral uh, movements without external rotation the best way to do that would be besides your pendulum to make them supine and do those exercises which are active assisted and when they do the forward flexion the scapula is well stabilized once they are supine they are able to raise them up very well this is what basically we uh, yes. nagraj you follow uh, what do you follow what is your protocol so basically sir i just like to bring in few points for the benefit of the audience there have been studies where the immobilization has been done in external rotation and they have shown excellent healing but it is not possible because the compliance is very poor adequate amount of literature is there now that forceful internal rotation or external rotation is not really the way, way forward just put them in a sling for about 3 weeks this is the average of all the studies that have been mentioned that's what i follow in my practice and like sir said uh, focus on the scapula and the general rehab after that so but that's the only point in terms of uh, you know duration Nilesh, your protocol? Yeah, pretty similar, sir. More, three weeks is roughly, by and large, what it is. But more importantly, till the patient is pain-free, like in an ACL, in the initial state, the patient is inflamed, is not willing to do that range of motion, is is very hesitant, and you would want to wait for the joint to quieten up. So likewise, here, a traumatic shoulder, you would wait for the pain and the inflammation to settle down before really starting off with rehab. So that's the rationale: three weeks, and that's good enough time for the joint to quieten up. okay uh any any special uh, suggestions about movements good old days we used to tell them that never ever do this never play badminton that kind of thing so is there any difference when you conserve and when you operate no i think see the intention is to get, go back to the sports you know they want to get operated just the reason is they want to go back to sports and even if they opt for conservative treatment on again the reason is they want to get back to sports earliest so i think uh, avoiding abduction exploration uh, it I mean, can't be is, the solution this was, this was the suggestion that was given or advice that used to be given good old, in good old days that's why i am asking you yeah yeah okay uh generally the range of movement achieved is similar in both the cases both the groups yes uh, i guess so yes so i think i think narvekar sir is the senior most here but i in my in my career i have not seen a single post op patient of arthroscopic repair ever losing arthroscopic bank card repair for instability ever lose out on movement they eventually get full range okay if you have done a rompissage it's possible that an abduction or external rotation might be slightly restricted but by and large the forward flexion and abduction eventually just comes back to normal i hardly have seen a patient who's lost out on movement narvikar sir your thoughts on it 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. Only thing is that you got to see that the person has a full range before in case you're doing it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Conserve. Yeah, sure. But very sure. often what has happened is that most of the people who come to you after some time being treated by somebody else, they have been immobilized for four to six weeks or longer. And once that happens, okay, it is very difficult to get their range back that easily. And once yeah. your range is got, then yes, you could go ahead and maybe uh, go do the bankers. And very rightly said, we don't lose any movements when you're doing the... Uh, Eventually, they get their entire reach. So, uh, in short, most of the young patients would deserve surgery either first time or second time as per Dr. Shirish, correct? Yeah. If it is second time, you would definitely operate. Number yes. two, physiotherapy is very, very important. It's not just surgery, but physiotherapy. Generally, how long it takes for them to go back to sports? Especially when you're talking of, say, badminton or tennis. And if you're talking of, say, uh, football. And if you're talking of athletics. So These would be three about, different groups, as I understand. So when you're talking about overhead, it is not before nine months or maybe even 12 months. Because okay. we, we basically develop the entire chain. That is how we will look at it. So it goes, you know, after getting your range and your strength, you do your functional training and then you start getting the core strengthening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the overhead athletes, obviously, you take a much longer time. Those who are not overhead athletes, it doesn't really matter. It would happen much earlier. Any other inputs from the faculty? So all overhead athletes, uh, yeah, minimum nine months. And when they start, I advise them to use uh, a shoulder support uh, or a shoulder sleeve at least to begin with. Uh, it gives them some mental support and a uh, lot of uh, sports centers worldwide also recommend use of that. Uh, so I think they also feel, you know, safe. Otherwise, it is almost safe. But they have to undergo sports-specific training, shadow play, before they actually start uh, in uh, competing in the overhead athlete and games. I think the other thing which I am a little worried about when I'm talking about RTS, that is return to sports, is Getting back to swimming, I think swimming is something I'm a little hesitant because till the scapular control is not very good and till patients really are not confident about their shoulder, that's an activity that I refrain. Probably that's the last that I allow them to do. And uh, otherwise, rest of it is pretty much similar to what uh, Dr. Narvekar and what Shiri spoke about. But uh, one important yeah, thing agree. is to develop their core. Yes. I think developing their core is so important. Getting their rotations in the spine is very important, especially the sp swimmers. As a matter of fact, we encourage them to use their spine much more than their shoulder. Same thing happens with the overhead badminton players. That we make them move their spines a little bit more because the moment you have an inadequate core, then you start using more and more of your scapular muscles. And that is where the recurrence starts coming up with micro instabilities. So if you allow them to have, I mean, you make them use their core very well. And if you do their uh, functional training well, before you allow them to get into the sport, it makes a lot of difference. So something which... Nagra, you wanted to say something? I think I'll wind up quickly because, uh, Shirish. So uh, the only thing I wanted to tell you is that in a young patient who is in, uh, in a young uh, patient, adolescent, we need to understand that sometimes their anatomy is not suited to the kind of sport they are in. So if I'm operated on a wrestler, whose tissue quality, who's got this sort of ominous features on his, uh, uh, on his uh, shoulder, we need to tell him that he is not suited for this particular sport. That is also equally important. You know, sometimes whatever, you're, whatever you do, the chance of recurrence increases because their anatomy doesn't match their sporting demands. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in short, significant physiotherapy is needed for a prolonged time. I mean, this is one very important message. So, to summarize, young patients, most of you would suggest MRI. Decide on surgery based on MRI and whether it is first dislocation or second dislocation. Thirdly, even after you operate, lot of physiotherapy would be needed to get back to original sports. So, I think, uh, let me have just a... Let me have a uh, uh, last, last message from, last one line message from Shirish and uh, Dr. Narvekar. 
and then we'll wind up. I think uh, if I have a young person who has, uh, uh, who's basically involved in any type of overhead activity and has had a dislocation and comes to me at that point of time, okay, I would be more inclined to do his uh, uh, surgery at that point rather than waiting for a second dislocation because I think that you are going to cause a little bit of instability, micro instability in these patients and my result may not be as good. But yes, second dislocation is not very late. But between the first and second dislocation, you could have repeated subluxations, which probably the patient may not tell you. And then your results would not be as good as when they were, if he had a single dislocation. But that is in a young person who is really interested in overhead activities, whatever they may be. Yeah. Kirish, just yeah, last thing comment. Is, well, yeah. Uh, so uh, comment is when you are dealing with shoulder instability, just identify this high risk uh, group. And you have to understand that treatment is slightly different for this uh, patient group. That's it. Otherwise, it's almost same. So, in short, you can't give a, a verdict as to uh, you should operate or you should not operate. Patient selection is vitally important. And that's one very important message that uh, the both of you and the panel members has given us. I, I thank all of you for a, a very, very educative webinar. And uh, I thank uh, Sham and Neeraj for developing a platform like this. I uh, thank you very much, all the participants, uh, as well as people who are watching on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you sir. Pleasure. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.